opportunity to build, to create, to make a difference is everywhere. And when you're thinking about graduation and what you want to do, I want to underline that there's opportunity everywhere. Today I'm going to talk about what I did in the gold mining industry. And you have to think mining isn't a very sexy place to be looking for opportunity. And I combined it with today's technology to alter the game plan. It was called the Gold Corp Challenge. And it was about a mine in northwestern Ontario that had already been going for 50 years. It had poor labor relations, it was high cost, and the entire industry thought it was going to close in three years. Today, it is considered the richest gold mine in the world. In 1995, I took a, in 1994, I took $10 million and gave it to our exploration group and said, go explore. And they went exploring, came back a month and a half later and said, we found something you might like. And it was nine drill holes with an average concentration of gold in those drill holes, 30 times what we were mining at the time. So I said, spend that money as quickly as you can. And if you find more, I'll give you more money. And after a couple of years, this deposit had grown in size. And we were looking to build a new processing plant. And I said, I went to our geologist and said, how big will this mine become? How big is the deposit? And they said, we don't know. I said, all right. Well, how long is it going to take you? And they said, we don't know. And I said, I don't like either of those answers. So how do we get on top of this? And I thought, well, why don't we get all of our geologists together and come in to sit down for two days and talk about the ideas that they hadn't shared with everybody else, the ideas that had been rejected by their boss. So I was the CEO of the company, and I had all of our exploration people there prepared that way, came into the room and said, let my head of geology run it, the session. And three minutes into it, I said, time out. Do you mind sitting down? And then I asked, I said, who's the youngest in the room by tenure, the person who's been here the shortest time? I'd like you to come up right now and talk about the last idea your boss shot down. And you could just feel this nervousness in the room. And <laughs> there was this giant arc of electricity going from the boss to this employee and said, you do that and you're fired. <laughs> and I said, well, let's just stop right here. I'm going to say the first person who threatens to fire someone is fired now. <laughs> a little bit of nervous laughter in the room. And after two days, there was a lot of sharing of ideas. And people went out with a new focus, new energy, new purpose. And I thought, this is great. But how do we do it on a larger scale? And I started, and it's sort of like, that was the, the seed of the thought. Where do we get more input? How do we make it bigger? Well, we could invite geologists that retired from our company. We could invite government officials that are specialists there. I said, well, we could even invite the competition. That seemed rather radical to most people. But and then as time went by, I thought, well, on every continent, there is a similar geological setting. And therefore, there should be experts. And how do we get in touch with them? Now, the mining industry, I grew up in the investment industry and jumped into the mining industry after about 18 years. And I moved into an industry that was really archaic and slow and rigid in its thinking. And I thought, well, we've got to bring it into the 21st century. So I signed up for a course on information technology at MIT, and I went off there. The second day there, they started talking about open source code and Linux. And all of a sudden, the light bulb just went off. And I said, that's what I was looking for. That was the template. And I ran back home and said to our geologists, we're going to take all of our geological data that is proprietary. It's sort of like the formula for Coke. You don't give it out. And we're going to throw it up on the web. We're going to put it together with software that you can see it in two and three dimensions. And we're going to ask the world to tell us where we're going to find the next six million ounces of gold in our mine. And for that, we'll offer prizes of half a million dollars. And that was rather radical, because the mining industry thought we were absolutely crazy. Um, and we moved along. And what surprised me was the diversity of the input. We threw it up on the web. And we had 
an amazing amount of uh, input. This is a picture on the left of the Red Lake mine in the late 40s. And we built a brand new mine, which is wired with fiber optics and has a virtual reality lab in it so you can see everything in 3D. But that's state of the art. And so we went out, that was just the web page cover, and we wanted to connect with the creativity in the world using today's technology. And it was something, as, um, as Tom said, you're not restricted. Your imagination is not restricted once you go out and are asking people around the world to tell you where it might be. So we, in a very short period of time, there was 240,000 hits, 1,400 downloads. It was a 400 megabyte file, so we sent it out in CD rather than downloading. Lots of countries around the world and some submissions. I had a panel of judges who said, look for the most creative ideas and best geological logic, and they started picking. Um, this is uh, part of the winning submission, and this type of computer graphics was unknown in the industry. Now, this is 10 years ago, so I want to tell you that opportunities are out there, and you just have to look in the past for ideas, because it takes a long time for a good idea to come through society, to go through different businesses. And if you start researching research done, new ideas, you will find opportunities. And I think when you look at opportunities, to see them, you have to have a curious mind and an inquiring nature. To take advantage of it, you have to be passionate, you have to be focused, and you have to be persistent. But they're there. So this is a big chunk of gold. That weighs a rock about this big. It's about 70 pounds, and it's 30% gold. So we invested a million dollars, $500,000 to build our website and do all the promotion, another $500,000 in prizes, and we found $3 billion of gold. It's not a bad equation. <laughs> so the other thing, this was a mine that was 50 years old. So you would expect you'd know all the geology. From the web, the submissions we got, there were 110 targets developed. And 50% of those targets were brand new to us. And of those targets, we hit on 80% of them. And none of the people that participated in our contest visited the mine. So you can get all sorts of collaboration and effort done very, very quickly. Uh, we had huge exposure because, I mean, mining companies don't use the web. Mining companies are dinosaurs. Everybody knows that. But we had this exposure, and suddenly we were a mining company that was in the 21st century. Um, and this is a picture of the mine. We went from producing 500,000 or 50,000 ounces a year at a cost of $360 an ounce to after we built the new mine, we were producing over 500,000 ounces at $60 cost. So there was a 60-fold change in the economics of the property. And as a result, this is a graph just compared to the largest gold mining companies and intermediate companies at the time. What our stock price was doing is shown in yellow. Clearly outperforming the world. But to me, this wasn't our competition. Our competition was the growth sector. And this is just a bar chart showing the profit margins that we were realizing, net profit margins. And we are on the left, and you can see all sorts of names that are in the Fortune 100, uh, whether it be Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, GE, Exxon, IBM, Microsoft, we were outperforming all of them. And so in my mind, I said, I'm not going to go and tell my story to people who buy gold stocks. I'm going to tell, because that's only 1% of the market. 34% of the market buys growth stocks, and we, by definition, were a growth stock. And that's how we compare against these large multinational firms. And that's 34% of the market. So I figured if I could get a sliver of 34% of the market rather than a sliver of 1%, we'd have a much better run in our share price. So you heard that through cloud computing earlier, you can access all sorts of expertise. And we definitely shortened the time 
we ended up with 25 semi-finalists and they were, I, they were amazing. They came from all over the world. The, and I point out that the first place winner was, there were two of them. It was a collaborative effort between two competing consulting firms in Australia. And the principals of those firms found themselves sitting in a reception room of a major Australian mining company waiting to pitch them and somehow something backed up. And they went and said, one fellow said, have you heard about this contest? It's in Canada. I, I can do this and this, but I can't do the other part. And the other fellow said, well, I could do that. So they came together. They were competitors. They came together. They'd never been to Canada. And after this contest and them coming in first place, within a year, Revenue Canada was saying, you're coming to Canada too often because their business went up and said, you have to pay taxes here now. <laughs> but you can shorten the time, reduce costs, and increase knowledge. We set off a gold rush in the district, and for the next two years, by sharing this information with the world, it was the largest, it, there were the most companies spending the most money on gold exploration in the world in northwestern Ontario as a result of what we did. And that was by making it all available. The idea, when I first um, put it to our geologists, they said, um, what's this, this deposit we have? Do you think it's world class? And we said, yes. Um, but I'm not sure if we should do it because there'll be people out there that will buy property around us. Maybe someone will take us over. And I said, well, if someone takes us over, they're going to have to pay a premium and you have options, so you're going to be in the money. If they don't take us over and then we make a big discovery and it gets better known, your career is going to be enhanced. And he said, okay. And I said, if we take this report and push it out to every university in the world with your name on it, do you think it'll hurt your career? <laughs> He had the right answer there. We did the launch. Just before we did the launch, all of the geologists came to me and said, Rob, you've asked for this, for us not to put anything out there in terms of our target. And I said, yes, I want a blind test. And they said, well, we're afraid that the rest of the world's going to think that you think that we're stupid because you're asking everybody else to give you the answer. And I said, no. I will just be able to write the check a lot easier if they come back and say the target that you have back over here they haven't seen is the same one they have. And we'll make this a lot easier. The judges came, we had a panel of judges from Australia, uh, United States, South Africa, and Canada. And I just said, look for the most innovative thinking. There were some really surprising ones. You think of geology as an inorganic science and there were people coming in with biological or organic solutions to inorganic problems. There were people coming in with computer graphics that just blew me away that I could go out and sell to institutional shareholders immediately. There were people using very advanced mathematics. Um, it was very, very exciting. The analysts, when we first brought it out, they just said, look, this is, <laughs> this is kid play. What are you doing? A year later, they thought it was great. BHP, the largest mining company, said, let's call something the Goldport Challenge. And then there's been Wikonomics and The World is Flat and uh, Mavericks at Work, a number of books that have come out to write up what we did. I'd like to tell you that you should, for me, this happened because constantly questioning the fundamental underlying assumptions of a business or an organization. Don't accept what is there as being the best way. Um, I think the application can be in any industry and we're starting to see a lot of that. Um, David mentioned that um, out of this, I decided that Mother Nature had been very kind and wanted to share some. And we, my wife and I established the Center for Regenerative Medicine here in Toronto. It's one of the 10, I'm told, one of the 10 best in the world right now in terms of the scientific talent. And it's a remarkable world where I think uh, regenerative medicine can make a profound change on the delivery of health care, make it cheaper. We had an opening, Sir Bob Geldof opened the center for us um, back in 96. And I'd like to leave you with a quote, a couple of quotes. But one, Henry Ford said it, he said, if you think you can do something, or if you think you can't do something, you're right. And one person in my life, well, my, two people, my mother and my father, um, had a very big impact on me. My father more so, not more so, but in a, in a way, he came back from World War II in an iron lung. 
completely paralyzed, and I said, we're gonna, the doctor said, you'll never get out of bed, we're gonna cut your legs off because we're gonna go gangrene, and that's it. And he said, well, cut them off. And my oh. grandfather, who was a, a surgeon, said, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, but my dad wanted to be a doctor like his father. And he said, what am I gonna do? Um, well, he said, I'm not gonna stay in bed. And out of sheer willpower, he forced himself out of bed. And then he got around the world, and the only continent he wasn't on was the one that Mark was at, Antarctica. But he was everywhere else. He flew helicopters across the Arctic and went down mines two miles below the surface of South Africa. He loved life, but to him, he accomplished something that very few people have to test in themselves, and that is overcoming these hurdles, the medical problem that says you're never gonna get out of bed. And through the power of will, he said, I'm gonna get out of bed. And to me, when I look at problems today, I, I think of him every day and go, that problem he had is bigger than anything I will ever have. And so what's put in our path is an obstacle that over time we will get around, we'll go over it, we'll go under it, but when we get over it, it's like a rock being placed in a stream, it will create new music in that stream. And just, there's a way to get around life. Um, thing, breakthrough, uh, quickly, um, I did a lot of water skiing and one day I saw a kite go by and this is water ski kite flying and you do the slalom and a uh, gymnastics run in the air. And this is an inverted, position. Um, I bought one of these and fell out of the sky pretty quickly and was much more cautious on my next flight. <laughs> a couple of, uh, at the end of the summer, someone came along, a couple of guys I met were the best flyers in North America and they said, why don't you fly with us next year? And I went to a competition and they said, here we are, uh, what are you going to do? And I told them the tricks and they said, that's not very good. <laughs> they hung me up in a tree, did two hours of tricks, then said, go do those tricks. And I did all the tricks I knew, and then I did a couple more, and I didn't fall out of the sky, and all of a sudden, I, I knew that the limits of my life were imposed by myself, because I was in this room that had a ceiling and walls, and when I did that last trick that I thought I was gonna land on the water, it just blew the doors and the ceilings and everything out, and at the end of the summer, I was fourth in North America. Um, ran for president um, in my undergraduate at Western of student council, and then became uh, that opened another door, did an MBA, traveled around the world in a completed army truck for five months, saw the world, um, got married two weeks after my father died, went through a 46 month long strike where you know you can do things that are death threats and this is something, a slave is someone who waits for someone else to free them. Ezra Pound, plane crash, had a family, order Canada and the impossible. Wait list a month ago. Zero G. Thank you.